I'll be reading John 11, 17 through 44 for the New International Version of the Bible. Jesus comforts the sisters of Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answers, I know he'll rise again in the res resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. <clears throat> I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, <clears throat> Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews that had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. <clears throat> Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, <clears throat> could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Once again, Jesus more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor because he has been in there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I'm excited to introduce our speaker for this morning. Uh, before I do that, one correction I need to make. When I introduced our new members, I introduced Les and uh, James, I introduced James as his grandson. In fact, uh, James is his son. So for my next trick, I will shove my entire foot in my mouth. So, <laughs> but really excited to have uh, Virgil Fry with us this morning. Um, he's got a very impressive list of credentials. I've printed a few of those out in the bulletin for you to look at. I wanted to take just a moment and uh, talk about why I personally uh, have really valued Virgil uh, for I guess about the last three and a half years. Uh, when I was working on my degree at Lipscomb, uh, one of the things they required us to do for a class was to talk monthly uh, for six months with a spiritual director, and Virgil was the guy that I happened to pick off of the list, and we started talking, and that has, uh, for me, been a real blessing because it's continued. So uh, once a month for about an hour for the last three and a half years, I, I talked to Virgil, and uh, he has just been such a good sounding board for me, such a good encouragement, and uh, through our transition of moving to this strange new world called Corpus Christi, that was one thing that stayed steady in my life. I continued talking to my friend Virgil, and uh, he was a great help and encouragement to me. Uh, he's very well suited uh, to talk ab about the subject he has 
for this morning. And even looking around the room, I'm reminded of how a grief is so near and something that we do have to deal with and face in our lives. Uh, thinking, of course, about the horrible news we got out of Sutherland Springs last week, but even as I was walking, uh, our brother, watching our, our brother Clay walk in earlier, I know Clay lost his dad last week. Uh, grief is something that, that hits very close to home. Uh, so, Virgil, at this time, I want to invite you to come and to speak to us about a God who weeps. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, congregation, for the opportunity to be with you. I appreciate uh, getting to connect with you a little bit. Uh, I am with a ministry called Lifeline Chaplaincy that's out of Houston and Austin and Dallas and Fort Worth, and we have a representation for Churches of Christ and some of the major hospitals in those cities, and it's, uh, it's an honor to get to uh, take some of our stories and to be with you uh, this day. Uh, and I appreciate very much the ministry that Mark and Carolina are involved with here. And um, most of you feel pretty good about Mark, too, and I don't quite get that. But I'll give you more stories about him later if you'd like. But no, I actually do get it. Uh, you're, you're very blessed to have uh, him with you, and, and he cares and loves for you deeply. You need to know that. Listen, if you would, to uh, this story. Imagine a long time ago, a coastal region of great importance. Merchandise was exchanged, cultures and languages and religious practices sometimes coexisted, sometimes clashed. In the middle of this region lived a man whom some disliked. Others, though, considered him very wise and genuine, a, a sort of life-changing guru. This guru didn't make a living off his wisdom. Instead, he lived among the townspeople and plied his craft as he also changed lives. The years passed and a community of people was formed centered on an extraordinary love they had for one another and they and this guru became very close indeed. One night the guru called everyone together. He began to make a beautifully crafted farewell speech, words that came directly from his big heart. He reminisced. He mentioned tears he had shared with them tears of joy and pain and endurance and conviction, tears of a love that had been nurtured in the very best of ways humans can love. Then it was crystal clear what the guru was saying. He was leaving. Once he boarded the ship, they would never see each other again. The ship would be taking the guru to a new and unknown places and adventures, perhaps even his death. But before he could board the ship, this special community refused to let him go without saying goodbye. So the people surrounded him, gathered him to themselves with hugs and kisses, well wishes, prayers, and yes, even tears. And it was the tears that spoke the loudest, for some sorrows defy words. In such times, tears are the clearest ways to share broken hearts and deep mutual love. As Max Licato succinctly puts it, when words are most empty, tears are most apt. The ship pulled out of harbor, sorrow and thanksgiving erupted, and those shared bittersweet tears were symbols of a God-given gift of love that never ends, even in absence. You may recognize that as a reworking of the story of Paul when he was leaving in Acts, the 20th chapter. Uh, the, the place of Ephesians and the people gathered there and openly shared their tears at this departure. If you grew up in Sunday school like I did and were asked uh, to quote a memory verse, what's the shortest verse in the Bible you could always fall back on? Jesus wept. Oh, some of you use that one a lot, I can tell. Had it read to us a while ago. And so, uh, you know, a good teacher would not let you get away with that. We said, okay, we got that one. What, give, it, give me something else. So you'd have to go to third Habakkuk or something like that and get something obscure. There is no third Habakkuk, so don't worry. But that verse, uh, in, in its shortness, the two words, is also extremely profound. And so my question, I guess, for you today would be, what makes you weep? What brings tears to your eyes? Are you like a friend of mine in Fort Worth who talks about his wife who can uh, 
cry so easily. He said, the grand opening of a grocery store is enough to make her weep. Some of us cry pretty easily. Some of us not so much. Uh, there's all kinds of things that brings tears to, to our eyes, a funeral or a memorial service or remembering someone. Weddings and births and adoptions, um, reuniting people who have not seen each other in a while. Sometimes it brings tears. When my dad turned 80, he had a twin sister who actually lived down here in, in Aranzas Pass. And in, uh, in our hometown in West Texas, my sister had arranged for this twin sister to come up uh, and to surprise my dad. It was also her 80th birthday, she reminded us, a, which was true. Uh, I guess as twins, we, uh, we, we got it. But my sister put her in this big refrigerator box in the middle of the fellowship hall and brought my dad in. And there's this group of people around, and he's, he's pretty surprised at the party itself. And so he was instructed to, to open the, the refrigerator box. And as soon as he did, there's his twin sister. And guess what the first thing both of them did? They smiled at each other, and then they started wiping the tears away. There's a bond there that uh, even geography had not kept them apart. And as soon as they saw each other, the tears came. It was very touching. Sometimes it's a baptism. Sometimes it can be a particular prayer. Um, many years ago in a former life, I was a youth minister and uh, had taken a group of uh, middle school, junior high uh, kids to a, a camp uh, outside of San Antonio in the hill country. And we were there for, for quite some time, for several days. And one of our uh, adult sponsors, Richard, had an idea that I didn't know about. But he called us all together. And, and he said, I want to I wanna pray now. And he went around. And we were all kind of in this little circle under this outdoors tabernacle. And Richard prayed for everyone in the group, every camper and every adult there. And it, it really was very moving, very touching. And... Uh, when he got through, uh, you always have to have one kid that, you know, he's just that kid. You know what I'm saying. And uh, this kid, I won't name him, but his name was Chris, uh, said, wait, there's something wrong. And, and I'm standing there thinking, well, way to ruin the moment. I said, well, what is it, Chris? And he said, nobody prayed for Richard. And as soon as he said that, I kind of swallowed hard, and, I, and a tear came to my eye. And he probably thought, uh-oh, I've done it again. But in fact, he had done exactly the right thing. He had named something. He was sensitive and aware of something that I had missed, that Richard was not being prayed for. And so I asked Chris to actually pray for Richard. So sometimes we just get blindsided by, by things. that we, we don't have it on our schedule, and it just catches us by surprise when the tears come up. Um, sometimes sharing a victory or defeat and... Uh, uh, I used to, when I was in college, I worked some with Special Olympics in, in Abilene. And, and to see children and adults get to, just to participate in a sport that all it mattered was that they got to participate. Uh, if that didn't bring a tear to your eye, uh, then um, uh, something was just wrong. So sometimes it's just intense gratitude that uh, the hurricane bypassed us or the, the lab results were better, the doctor report was better. Uh, sometimes it's just tears of being thankful for the news. I have a, a friend who has passed away, but it was, her name was Sister Alice Potts. She was a, a staff chaplain at MD Anderson for many years. And we became quite close. And she came down one day and she said, I just had the most interesting visit with a patient up on the floor. And I was talking to this woman, and as I was talking to her and she began to tell some of her story, uh, tears came to her eyes. And, and Alice said to this woman, she said, you know, we're here in this hospital and there's a, there's a lab just down the hall from us. I wonder what would happen if we took a culture of your tears and sent it to the lab, what it would say, where those tears come from. I thought that was a fascinating image of, of sometimes tears have things in them that, that are just so deep that sometimes we can't even describe what it's about. Well, what have you been taught about tears? Uh, you men, were you ever taught to uh, boys don't cry? Suck it up and just keep going? Yeah, you were taught that. I, I, I know you were. Uh, you know the old Four Seasons song, Big Girls Don't Cry? So, you know, that knocks the, the girls out from crying too. So sometimes culturally we're taught not to cry, that tears are a sign of weakness or as faith. Uh, 
uh, you just don't have enough faith, so stop crying. Or as a good parent, sometimes we say to our kids, uh, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. You know, th those kind of wonderful statements that we make. Some of you made that statement or heard it, I can tell. So, um, Sometimes the tears, we, we, we turn them inward. We bite our lip to keep them from coming out. Or we clench our fist, but the tears are still there. What have you taught, been taught in church about prayers? You probably, uh, uh, not prayers, uh, tears. Uh, you were taught something, uh, whether you realized it or not. Uh, there are times I can be visiting with a patient in a hospital, and uh, we make part of that visit a prayer to God on behalf of that person. And sometimes tears come to that person's eyes. And more than once, I have had patients look at me and apologize for crying. I'm sorry that I, that I cried, as if they have violated some ecclesiastical rule somewhere that you're not supposed to cry if, it's, if there's spirituality involved. Um, tears are just part of, part of the human experience, and you don't have to apologize. Uh, I mentioned in class today, I've actually heard ministers stand before a congregation and say there will be no tears at this funeral today because this is a great victory for God and we are only going to celebrate. And I'm thinking, where do you get the idea that we cannot celebrate and mourn and grieve at the same time? We can do both. We are complex human beings. God made us where we can do both. And nobody really has the right, even from Scripture, to say, don't cry, you'll only make it worse. Sometimes people just don't get the sacredness of tears. Uh, when my wife Carol died, uh, we were having a service for her at a funeral chapel in Dallas. And I... I before that service, uh, when I had been a youth minister, it was in Fort Worth, some people from that uh, congregation had come over, and I was standing in, literally in front of the casket just a few minutes before the service was to begin, and I hadn't seen some of them in a long time. We'd been through a lot of life experiences together, and there were tears, and there was some joy going on of just seeing each other, but the sadness of it uh, was, was being shared at that moment with some people that were very close to both Carol and to me. And in the middle of that visit, again, just a few minutes before the service, somebody from the funeral home came up to me with a clipboard in her hand, and she said, Mr. Fry, I've got to talk to you. And I said, right now? And she said, yeah, it's very important. We've got to talk before the service. So I left the people I was talking with and went down a, a little ways, and she said, you have to sign this for the business office before the service begins. <laughs> And I'm, to this day, I don't know what I signed. I don't care what I signed. It wasn't important to me. And uh, I was thinking, she just doesn't get it. Um, and, and I know she had something to accomplish, and I, and I understand that part. But the moment was just wrong to interrupt tears uh, uh, and the sacredness of it. Frederick Beekner has said, God is most near and does his best work when we allow our tears of brokenness to flow. That's quite a statement that God does his best work when we let go of the veneer that we've got it all together and we're looking good and we've got it, uh, we're hanging in together. But when we let the brokenness and the tears come through, uh, the view that God does his best work there in our brokenness. So today's gospel reading, uh, if we believe in the incarnation of, of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the question could be, well, what makes God weep? And it's pretty fascinating to think of a God who weeps just like we weep. And I think that's claiming the full uh, humanity of Jesus Christ to know he knew what it was like to have brokenness and to lose a friend and to weep over it. That's a very different God than sometimes the Greco-Roman gods that were very, uh, they had the, all these strange mythological stories and sometimes they were so angry with each other that it would spill over to human beings uh, and they were doing all this strange stuff. And so you, you tried to spend all your time appeasing these gods who were easily provoked. And you just tried to keep them at a distance. But Yahweh God says, I am you and you are with me. And in the, in the form of Jesus Christ shows us what it's like to be fully deity and fully human, including the sharing of tears. 
So yeah, our God can be angry. There are times in Scripture it's very clear God is angry. But if you really look at those, I find the angry passages of God are when we as human beings fail to embrace the loving invitation of being fully humans in God's care. That that's what provokes his anger. Ken Geyer, when he was talking about uh, this scene from John 11, made a statement like this. Who's to say which is more incredible? A man who raises the dead or a God who weeps? I personally want a God that can do both. I need that kind of God. And that's what we have in our story today. It's referred to in the passage, the two, two chapters earlier in John chapter 9. You remember when, when Jesus uh, brought sight to a man who was born blind? And, and he went about rejoicing because he had this new vision that he had never had. And then there were some people in the city that were very upset that this had happened. And they brought this man in and basically gave him an inquisition about Jesus and who is this guy that, that uh, restored your sight and even brought his parents in. And, and they, he and Jesus reconnected. And apparently it bothered Jesus a great deal that there were people that not only didn't know how to weep with those that weep, they didn't know how to rejoice with someone who was rejoicing. You know that passage in Romans where we're told to do both. It bothered Jesus a lot that, that they could not rejoice with somebody who had their sight that had never had it. So when Jesus shows up after, after traveling in the fourth day of death and he shows up to his friends and they're told they're very good friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in, in the town of Bethany. The first thing that happens is he's greeted uh, by Martha and said, Lord, if you had been here. Um, and then Mary comes out uh, later, says the very same thing. Lord, if you had been here. And there's a group of people that came out with Mary. And the people that came out with them were, were mourners, those who came to grieve with her. The custom of that day was that when you lost somebody significant in your family, there were people that came to your home and just set up camp with you, and you had one job, grieve. Seven days of grieving. That's all you were supposed to do. You weren't supposed to be hospitable. You weren't supposed to try to put on a good, happy face for everybody. You were supposed to grieve. And so when Mary gets up and goes out to meet Jesus, they assume that she was doing her job to go to the tomb to weep over Lazarus. And so there's this group of people around, and Jesus uh, goes into this conversation, and um, he says, where have you laid him? And as he hears their tears, he joins them, and that's when Jesus wept. And you think uh, maybe somebody should have tapped him on the shoulder and say, wait a minute. Don't you believe in the resurrection? Where's your faith, Jesus? Why are you crying? Uh, we're not told that anybody did that. It, was not, it would not have been appropriate. Uh, I've heard uh, grievers be told, you know, you just need to keep it together. They wouldn't want you to grieve. I don't know where that statement comes from, but somebody feels certain that th they wouldn't want you to grieve. Uh, Jesus went with what came up. And, and we, we wonder, what's the source of Jesus' tears? And uh, we don't fully know. I think we could conjecture. But I think what's it's amazing is that the Jews who saw him weep had one response. See how he loved him. What a surprise to them. You weep over someone who has died that you love. They weren't surprised at all. The source of his tears, who knows, maybe it's uh, his own anger. It said he was moved in spirit and maybe anger over the lack of misunderstanding of this new kingdom coming in and it's right here and you still don't quite get it. Uh, the expectations that were even, even, he may have heard them say, well, wait a minute, this guy could restore sight to a blind man. Why couldn't he have kept his friend from dying? Sorrow and death, it was never a part of the original plan, according to the Genesis story. Anger and sorrow over the fact that death is part of the human experience. His own fear and insecurity of his own upcoming trial and crucifixion. 
And then we get this amazing description of our God, a man of sorrows, one acquainted with grief. That's the kernel of the story that I bring to us today. This is no ordinary God. This is a God who cares enough that in Luke 15, it's told about in the story that there's a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off and the 99 sheep are kept safe and the shepherd goes and looks for the one lost one. That's a pretty amazing God. I mean, you've got 99 there. I mean, why do you need to round it up to 100, right? I mean, unless you're the one that's wandering off. I have a friend that uh, started a Christian uh, theater in Houston, and we became good friends through the years. I picked her up for lunch one time, and she was kind of laughing at herself, but also wondering if she was in trouble. One of her actors was having a really tough day, and, and between scenes of rehearsing, she said he was sitting on the steps and he had his Bible open and he was just downcast in blue. So she walked over and, and asked what was going on. He said, this is just the worst day of my life. I, I just don't even want to be here. And I'm reading my Bible to see uh, where God is. And she said it just came to her. And she said, well, I wouldn't give you three cents for your God right now. <laughs> And uh, she said, he snapped his eyes up at her and said, what do you mean by that? She said, I need a God who's already there and is seeking for me, not one that I have to go looking for. She's basically retelling the story of Luke 15, of the sheep that was out there. Now, we have a responsibility to seek for God, but isn't it something that our God is already seeking us long before we may become aware that we're seeking him? The, the passage in Revelation, a song that uh, we sometimes sing, God shall wipe away all tears. It's, it's very important uh, that, that we understand it's who we are. So what kind of God do we have? What, the one that can have good friends, human friends? Uh, that's a part of the experience of Jesus Christ who loves deeply and who journeys into the daily mundane and actually into the, the place of death with people and indicates his own love and doesn't try to hide it. Not a distant, far-off God, but one, as Philip Yancey has says, a God who desperately seeks a relationship of love with every one of us. One time, uh, a, a couple of weeks after Carol's death, I was in worship service, and uh, I was sitting near the back because I wanted to be there, and I didn't want to be there. It was very hard to, to come to worship uh, the first few days after her death. But I was there, and, and I remember uh, the sermon uh, that day was on the gentleness of Christ. And uh, after, it was, after the service was over and I was trying to get out without seeing a whole lot of people, a friend of mine named Gail uh, stopped me. She said, Virgil, I, gotta, I need to tell you something. So I said, sure, Gail. And she said, when, when the sermon was on the gentleness of Christ, I started listing people in my head that I knew met that description. And one of the first people that I thought of was Carol. Well, as soon as she said her name, do you want to know what I did? I did what I'm just talking about. The tears just popped out of my, 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 on my face. And Gail kind of backed up and she apologized. She said, I am so sorry, Virgil. I didn't mean to make you cry. And I said, Gail, you didn't make me cry. The tears were already there. You gave them permission to come out because you named the one that I was thinking about as well. She didn't do anything wrong. She did exactly what was right. She gave me permission to let the tears that were inside to come out. So what is it that uh, makes you weep? Also probably makes God weep, according to this story. What makes you cry? It doesn't matter. Just Maybe we just need to go with it sometimes and to know that God is near. And that when you allow someone to share tears with you, you're actually giving them a gift of presence that reminds them that God is also present in those tears. So whether it's in front of a casket or, or a child's death or a financial ruin or the casualties of war or whatever it is that brings you to tears, we can just go with it in Christ because it's in our brokenness. It's in our brokenness that God meets us, not as our condemning judge, but as our father with open hands and open arms that takes us in. 
Before Hurricane Harvey came through and visited you as well as us in Houston this year, uh, nine years ago we had another visitor named Ike, uh, also of the Hurricane family. Uh, I don't know why all the male names are the worst hurricanes these days, but it used to be everything was a female on the hurricanes. You know they changed that. There's no connection to that. That's just a side note. Sorry I mentioned it. But uh, when I came through Houston, uh, the storm itself was not terribly bad and the flooding wasn't too bad, but the winds had knocked over enough trees and power lines and sometimes even cell phones that we were out of electricity. It, at that time, it was the most people that had been out of electricity of a group of people in, in a long, it's like two and a half million households that, that had no electricity, sometimes for days. My house was, was out of electricity for uh, a full week. My daughter was expecting her second child, uh, and she, w she was in an unair-conditioned hot house, and uh, so we were trying to deal with her. There was no food or refrigeration and all the good stuff that goes with it. And after a while, even the cell phones weren't working. Those of us that had landlines, that would work occasionally, but that was sporadic. But you had no way to recharge your phone unless you went out and, and put it in the uh, car and turn the car on, but there was no gasoline to replace the gasoline in the pumps. It was just a mess we don't realize how dependent we are on electricity till you don't have it. Um, I can remember the second night after the storm, I was home and it was so hot in my house that I went outside at one o'clock in the morning to cool off. And I stood out there on the back porch and it was so still, it was hotter outside than it was in my house at one in the morning. I thought, this is just different. So I had some friends that lived on a subdivision over from me, and there was a little pocket of the, their houses that still had electricity. And I, they talked to me, and they invited me over to spend the next night with them. They were my new best friends. I needed that. And so I went over the next night, and again, the whole city, the whole region was basically shut down. Uh, there's no, uh, no normal things going on, including electricity. And uh, so I slept well, nice air conditioning and all that good stuff. Got up the next morning and was uh, getting ready to go. And the TV was on and everything was about hurricane and, and the relief plans that went with it. And they were interviewing the, the director of the, of the Red Cross who said, we now have these stations set up across the city for people to get some supplies that they might need while they're trying to, to get through this time of no electricity. And the... And the person that was interviewing them says, well, how do people find out where that is? He said, well, the best way to find out is to go on the internet. <laughs> I thought, well, that's, that's a nice answer, but it, most of the people uh, are, are not listening to this because they don't even see it on TV. They don't have TV. I thought, man, um, there's an answer that wasn't that helpful, was it? And, uh, and then I thought, when you take the story of Jesus and you think, you know, he could have just stayed away and just said, well, it's all good. He could have resurrected Jesus from a distance easily. Uh, I believe that. But there was something about Jesus that rolls his sleeves up and gets in with humanity, even to the point of tears. I get concerned sometimes that uh, we build buildings, and believe me, I'm a big belie believer in buildings. I, I, we need them to gather but we can't just build a building and expect people to flock in and to hear about this God who weeps with us. Because part of our message is we've got to go out and be with the same people uh, that we're a part of in our community. And to weep with them and to laugh with them and rejoice with them. And that becomes the model of Jesus from John 11. What matters to the world the most around us is not what we believe but that we simply love as Christ loved. Who's to say which is more incredible? A God who raises the dead or a God who weeps? This congregation stands ready to help you in any way in your relationship and your walk with that God and we offer that invitation at this time as we stand.